So David Bromwich is the Sterling Professor of English here at Yale. Um, he is the editor of Edmund Burke's Selected Writings on Empire, Liberty, and Reform, and co-editor of the Yale University Press edition of On Liberty. He has written since 19, sorry, since 2007 um, for the Huffington Post, specifically on civil liberties and America's war. I'll need to distinguish uh, from the outset my uh, position, my commitment, and my situation uh, from the position, commitment, and situation uh, just now outlined for himself by uh, Omar Barghouti, whom I'm glad to be speaking with today. Uh, he sketched for you uh, thoroughly within a small compass uh, the total campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanction that he is a leader of, a, a nonviolent, a comprehensive, and a very well thought through movement, which embraces uh, a cultural, uh, academic, uh, as well as uh, military goods boycotts. I am uh, speaking only of one part of that which I support, uh, and that is the commitment to divest a pension fund that I have money in, and that Yale professors generally have money in, to divest that fund of uh, five prominent holdings that directly support the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. And uh, I, I do that because it, this, it's a very intelligible and simple to understand commitment for me. So let me make it clear that the argument for indirectly uh, bringing uh, to bear as much power and strength of negative will as we can against the state of Israel, because the state of Israel prosecutes the occupation, that is not what I'm speaking for. I'm speaking for divestment from funds that directly involve military and security activities in the occupied territories. Under the Fourth Geneva Convention, it is illegal, it is in violation of international law to administer occupied territories. That's not controversial anywhere except in Israel and the United States where they refer to not as occupied but as disputed lands sometimes. <clears throat> and I'm speaking, I should say, with no authority, unlike Omar Barghouti, who has been involved in these issues for a long time and who is, has much more competence in them than I do. I'm speaking only as an American citizen who feel I have consulted well with my conscience and my understanding of our history, what commitments I want my country to undertake on my behalf and what not to undertake. Um, I'm not alone in feeling that U.S. implication in support of the Israeli occupation of occupied territories is particularly dangerous to the United States, and as Omar Barghouti called several stories from Haaretz and uh, learned authorities of various kinds to witness, let me bring an unexpected witness forward, and he is General David Petraeus, then commander of CENTCOM in March 2010, who said before the Senate Armed Services Committee just under three years ago, and these are his words, the enduring hostilities between Israel and some of its neighbors, he means most of all, Palestine and its, those who support it, is one of the greatest, are one of the greatest challenges to security forces uh, of the U.S., to the security interests of the U.S. Because, said Petraeus, and these are his exact words now, the conflict foments anti-American sentiment due to a perception of U.S. favoritism. And he, he meant there, again, euphemistic, paraphrastic, he meant U.S. support for the occupation that militates against a cause of justice for the Palestinians. It is not uh, Petraeus who convinced me that this is not uh, a kind of action I want my country 
to support. It was more than anything else, if I had to cite a single event or episode, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces onslaught against Gaza in December 2008 and January 2009, timed for the transition between the Bush and Obama administrations, uh, a military action which I'm citing the approximate numbers, uh, killed 1,300 Palestinians, close to half of them uh, civilians, uh, and uh, 13 Israelis, 13 and 1,300. Those figures won't bear to be thought about under the description, quote, war. 1,300 being killed on one side, 13 on the other. Those figures stick in my mind, and though I don't seek arguments on this subject at all, uh, those are the figures I quote when I want to show how impossible I find argument about these things. Um, I should say one other uh, fact, a, a personal uh, sort of fact or story that aroused me to take more interest in uh, Israel and Palestine than I had before. And I repeat, I, I'm here as a second rater. Uh, my, my main commitments are for civil liberties in the United States and against our wars abroad. Those seem to be primary for an American. They have to be. Um, and if you think that Israel and Palestine have no relation to that, and that is your number one commitment, then you should not have anything to do with Israel and Palestine, but I don't know what books or papers you're reading if you think those two things are unrelated. But the personal anecdote I, I want to bring out has to do with the death of Rachel Corey. Some of you will know who she was, but I'll, I'll uh, uh, give her story briefly. Um, from, this is from a piece I wrote on the sixth anniversary of, anniversary of her death on March 16th, uh, 2009. She died on March 16th, 2003. And if the date sounds roughly familiar, one reason is it's two days before we launched our attack against Iraq. And the story of how she died, an American uh, in uh, Gaza, was, excuse me, in Rafah, was, was buried under um, reports of the uh, launching of our uh, shock and awe attack on Iraq. On March 16, 2003, in Rafah on the Gaza Strip, uh, Rachel Corey was run over by an armor-plated Caterpillar bulldozer, a machine sold by the U.S. to Israel, the armor put in place for the purpose of knocking down homes without damage to the machine. Rachel Corey was 23 years old, from Olympia, Washington, a sane, articulate, and dedicated American who had studied with care the methods of Gandhi and Martin Luther King. At the time that she was run over and then backed over by the bulldozer being driven by an Israeli Defense Forces soldier, Rachel Corey was wearing a fluorescent orange jacket and holding a megaphone. There is a photograph of her talking to the soldier in the cabin of the bulldozer not long before he did it. None of the eyewitnesses believed that it was accidental. And as some of you may know, Rachel Corey's parents sued the Israeli Defense Force, uh, Forces in an Israeli court last year. They did not win their case, but they received marginally more help from the Obama uh, administration than they had done from the Bush administration. Less than a month after that happened, on April 5th, 2003, the American peace worker Brian Avery was shot in the face and seriously disfigured by IDF soldiers uh, in Jenin. The group he was with were wearing red reflector vests with the word doctor written in English and Arabic. In 2009, another American peace worker, Tristan Anderson, who was protecting the new security fence, uh, excuse me, protesting, <laughs> protesting, not protecting, the new security fence in the West Bank town of Nilin, was shot by another uh, Israeli soldier. He was in critical condition for a time but recovered so as to be able to live some sort of life afterwards. Nobody with a history of being a victim, and I believe this strongly, and I think it is not commonly recognized, and it is even 
uh, a thought alien to many people who participate in protest movements on behalf, uh, on behalf of victims, who glorify victims and want victims to get revenge or reparations of a magnificent sort. Nobody with a history of being a victim can be rewarded with special, can be rewarded with or supposed to have special rights or special powers. That includes Jews as victims too. If we, Americans, Israelis, everyone, if we want to deserve our freedom, we must agree to live in a moral world where people are responsible for themselves. And just as we can't be punished for the things our parents did, so the wrongs we commit can never be justified by the things that our parents suffered. That would be true if a Palestinian generation arose that had great power and wanted to take revenge against the Jews. Look how much our parents suffered. Victimhood is bad for everyone. It is bad for everyone. <clears throat> the commandment governing the long-term good of a country is the same as that for an individual. In the dry and accurate words of Thomas Hobbes, seek peace. Not the most famous words of Hobbes, but truer than words of his that have become more famous. And in memory of Rachel Corey, I'd want to say that the addiction to war and indefinite expansion isn't just an Israeli problem. How did we Americans ever dare to suppose it was? So my sympathies, and this backs my own commitment to the divestment from assets, investments in companies that directly contribute to the occupation and the containment of occupied lands on the West Bank. My sympathies are with not only the Palestinians who suffer under such a regime, but because such people are closer to home, because I recognize them more easily, I have all those usual weaknesses, if they are weaknesses. And you can read Rachel Corey's letters, and you can see an interview or two with her, easily available online. My sympathies are with people like Rachel Corey, who work against injustice. I don't want, therefore, casually, to contribute to injustice by enriching companies that profit by oppression. And I say again, I say, I, this is my view and my commitment simply as an American citizen with no other standing in this particular argument. Thank you.